Today, we are moving to our neighboring country, Pakistan. When we think of the literature from Pakistan, probably the first language that comes to our mind is Urdu. Because who amongst us has not heard of Iqbal? And therefore, Urdu is the language that we associate with the literature from that country. But today, I'm going to be talking about a poet who writes in the English language. The 20th century, and even today, is dominated by the male writers. There have been a few female writers too in Pakistan. Names like Ada Jafri, Parveen, Imtiaz Dharkar, who is quite popular in India too, Kishwar, etc. do come to mind. The Urdu language is an important part of the literature from Pakistan. And therefore, many of our poets write in Urdu and their translations are available in the English language. But Zehra Nika writes both in English and in Urdu. Zehra Nigar, lovingly called Zehra Appa by most of her fans and readers in Pakistan. She was born in 1936 in Hyderabad, Deccan, and in 1947, along with her family, she migrated to Pakistan. Today she lives in London too. She began writing poetry from her childhood in an age dominated by men. It is indeed an irony that her mother learnt music from behind a parda. But Zehra Nigar writes about women, women not only of her country but women of the world. She is also well known as a script writer. One of the important awards that she has won is Pride of Performance for Arts. Interestingly, she published, should I say published, or she brought out CDs of her own poems in her own voice, which is not very common. Her well-known works are Wo Kitab, Suna Hai, Main Bach Gai. She is accepted. She is accepted as the first woman poet to challenge the traditional roles of women in her society. The Moonflower Tree. Let me begin by just telling you what actually the moonflower is. It's a tropical white flower referred to also as the morning glory. The poem, of course, is much more than about a flower or a flowering tree. As if in a dream, I remembered last night the trees in a corner of my garden studded with flowers of moonlight, right? It's a white flower and therefore she's thinking of the moonlight too. As the poem goes along, I keep wondering, is it a dream or is it a memory? I would raise the question to you too. I should play beneath its shade, sheltered afternoons long from the sun, swing on the bows, meeting them as they swayed, touch the flowers and run. Into its trunk had been sunk scores of nails. Many a time had I been warned not to touch those nails. Do you understand, my dear readers, how the poem becomes serious. We are talking of the trunk of the tree, but we are also talking about the nails that have been sunk into the tree. Probably this is about the repressed desires of women, not allowed to come out. Constantly there seems to be a morality check on them. And where does this check come from? The poet is sure it's not only society which is placing these checks on her. It is probably from the unconscious too. As I was reading this poem, I could not but 
help think of Freud, his id and the conscious and the unconscious. That tree, they said, was haunted, but a wise man had cast a spell on it, trapped the giant within, transfixed him with nails. Should anyone pull out to those pins, it would release the genie within. So you have all those checks on you. And what does the woman do? What does the modern, the contemporary woman try to do? Probably she wants to get out of all that. Probably she wants to be free. Probably she wants to not anymore have those repressed desires within her. But then what does society say? Society says beware because the tree is haunted. And if you try to do anything there, the genie will come out. I almost smile when I hear of the genie because to me, the genie is usually the good one. Remember, Aladdin's lamp. But here, you are frightened. You are told, don't you dare do it because the genie will come. And what would the genie do? Which would devour every flower, which would sap every leaf. Then this home, this house would burn in a flash into ashes it would turn. The woman is being warned. Don't you dare come out. Don't you dare try to fight against the rules, the rules that have been laid for you. And then she says, she concludes by saying, if ever I should touch those nails, that ogre might escape. The flowers he may not devour, the leaves he may not want, but my home would surely burn. Would it really into ashes turn? Will I be destroyed if I tried to find my real self? She leaves us with the question, do women in my society have the courage, have the temperament, have the ability to fight against society which has repressed me, us, all these centuries? A poem worth thinking about. A poem which is probably a dream, a poem which is probably from memory. Not so surprising that there are very few figures of speech. But when I say that, I want to talk about a figure of speech which has not come in any of the poems that I've been talking about so far, and that is called the Homeric simile. All of you have heard of metaphors and you've heard of similes, and usually a simile is just a comparison as what as white as milk may be, right? As strong as a lion. But a metaphor does not have as and like and all that. So what is a Homeric simile? When for line after line, 20, 30, 40 lines, the same simile goes on and on. Sorry if I talk about poems not directly related here, but you must read a poem called Sohrab and Rustam by Matthew Arnold. Anyway, to come back to our the moonflower tree. You know, it's a metaphor. What is a metaphor? The entire poem is a metaphor about the life of women in her society, in Zera Nigar's society. She talks about the tree, the trunk, the nails. And I explained the poem to you. I did tell you what they stand for. So could we read the poem again by ourselves and see how the extended metaphor is there? We have looked at a poem by a woman poet. There has been a condescending attitude towards women writers down the ages. And so ever so often we refer to them as the marginalized writers. I just want you to think about what we mean by that. All of us as school kids have had margins in our notebooks. We don't write on the margin, we write on the main sheet of the paper. So marginalist writers are writers who are not mainstream. Should women be marginalized writers? Enough point for a debate probably, 
but I would advise you, welcome you to read women poets down the ages.